Alrighty, folks. Can everybody hear me all right? Just want to make sure. I'm going to get TikTok set up while, uh, while we get this all started. Um, perfect. Seems like you guys can all hear me. It's your boy, Cheese Huss. Thank you all for hopping in here. Can everybody hear me all right? Oh, whoops. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Did not mean for that to come through. You might hear an echo of me for a moment. <clears throat> I'm going to get the TikTok chat set up as well. And then we'll, we will get this road on the show. Got TikTok up and running. <clears throat> Give me just a moment here and we'll get started. Hello to everybody hopping in. We're getting close. Yeah, they just got Malcolm last time. Yep, I think. All right, perfect, perfect. Sounds like everybody can hear me. All right. Well, without further ado, then let's get this started. Hello to everybody hopping he hopping in here on the uh, TikTok app. Thank you all for hopping in and uh, get ready for some more Jurassic Park. Just gonna adjust this a bit. <clears throat> Hello, Zed. Hello everybody hopping in, Jay, thank you all for joining, and uh, this first chapter is called Dawn, where we last left off, they were uh, trying to get the park stabilized again, they just got Malcolm back to the visitor center, and they think that things are starting to stabilize a bit, so we'll see where it goes from here. <clears throat> um... That would be cool. Well, first time seeing me stream. Well, thank you guys all for hopping in for your first time uh, seeing me stream. And let's get this started. So, like I said, this first chapter is called Dawn. Grant was awakened by a loud grinding sound, followed by a mechanical clanking. He opened his eyes and saw a bale of hay rolling past him on a conveyor belt, up towards the ceiling. Two more bales followed it. Then the clanking stopped as abruptly as it had begun, and the concrete building was silent again. Grant yawned. He stretched deeply, winced in pain, and sat up. Soft yellow light came through the side windows. It was morning. He had slept the entire night. He looked quickly at his watch. 5 a.m., Still almost six hours to go before the boat had to be recalled. He rolled onto his back, groaning. His head throbbed, and his body ached as if he had been beaten up. From around the corner, he heard a squeaking sound, like a rusty wheel. And then he heard Lex giggling. Grant stood slowly and looked around the building. Now that it was daylight, he could see that they were in some kind of maintenance building, with stacks of hay and supplies. On the wall, he saw a gray metal box and stenciled sign. Sauropod Maintenance Building, 04. This must be the sauropod paddock, as he had thought. He opened the box and saw a telephone, but when he lifted the receiver, he heard only hissing static. <clears throat> Apparently, the phones weren't working yet. Chew your food, Lex was saying. Don't be a piggy, Ralph. Grant walked around the corner and found Lex by the bars, holding out a handful of hay to an animal outside that looked like a large pink pig and was making the squeaking sounds Grant had heard. It was actually an infant triceratops, about the size of a pony. The infant didn't have horns on its head yet, just a, curvy, a curved bony frill behind big soft eyes. It poked its snout through the bars towards Lex, its eyes watching her as she fed it more hay. That's better, Lex said. There's plenty of hay, don't worry. She patted the baby on the head. You like hay, don't you, Ralph? Lex turned back and saw him. This is Ralph, Lex said. He's my friend. He likes hay. Grant took a step forward and stopped, wincing. 
You look pretty bad. I feel pretty bad. Tim, too. His nose is all swollen up. Where is Tim? Peeing, she said. You want to help me feed Ralph? The baby Triceratops looked at Grant. He stuck his... He stuck out both sides of his mouth, dropping on the floor as it chewed. Or hay stuck out both sides of its mouth, dropping on the floor as it chewed. He's a very messy eater, Lex said. And he's very hungry. The baby finished chewing and licked its lips. It opens its mouth, waiting for more, and Grant could see the slender, sharp teeth and the beaky upper jaw, almost like a parrot. Which, so, obviously... If you guys have seen the Jurassic Park movies or other depictions of Triceratops, it's always shown with a beak. And that's because it's pretty much confirmed that a lot of Ornithogen dinosaurs like that had beaks. Um, it's a pretty interesting tidbit, but yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, just once again, want to say thank you guys for uh, all hopping in. Okay, just a minute, Lex said, scooping up more straw from the concrete floor. Honestly, Ralph, she said, you'd think your mother never fed you. Why is his name Ralph? Because he looks like a Ralph, at school. Grant came closer and touched the skin of the neck gently. It's okay, you can pet him, Lex said. He likes it when you pet him, don't you, Ralph? The skin felt dry and warm, with pebble texture, like a football. Ralph gave a little squeak as Grant petted it. Outside the bar, its thick tail swung back and forth with pleasure. He's pretty tame. Ralph looked from Lex to Grant as it ached, and he showed no sign of fear. It reminded Grant that the dinosaurs didn't have ordinary responses to people. Maybe I can ride him, Lex said. Let's not. I bet he'd let me, Lex said. It'd be fun to ride a dinosaur. Which, don't get me wrong, I agree with her, but Grant's probably right. Probably not the best idea to try and ride a Triceratops whether it's a baby or an adult. <clears throat> uh... Grant looked out the bars past the animal to the open fields of the sauropod compound. It was growing lighter every minute. He should go outside, he thought, and set off one of the motion sensors on the field above. After all, it might take the people in the control room an hour to get out here to, to him and he didn't like the idea that the phones were still down. He heard a deep snorting sound, like the snort of a very large horse, and suddenly the baby became agitated. It tried to pull its head back through the bars, but it got caught on the edge by its frill, and it squeaked in fright. The snorting came again, and it was closer this time. Ralph reared up on its hind legs, frantic to get out from between the bars. It wriggled its head back and forth and rubbed its head against it. Ralph, take it easy, Lex said. Let's push him out, Grant suggested. He reached up to Ralph's head and leaned against it, pushing the animal sideways and backwards. Its frill popped free and the animal fell outside the bars, losing its balance and flopping onto its side. Oh dear. Sorry. The cat's getting into the bag. Literally. I have a bag from lunch still, uh, still here. And, uh, uh yeah. Sorry. My bad. <clears throat> As long as you don't make too much more noise, you can have the bag. I know she likes bags, so what can I say? It's just a big paper bag. This is also live on YouTube. Yes, to everybody uh, here in the TikTok chat. I saw that. I saw someone asking. It's live on YouTube and Twitch as well. Thank you to everybody who's watching right now. I hope everyone's enjoying. <clears throat> uh, da, 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 da. Then the baby was covered in shadow, and a huge leg came into view, thicker than a tree trunk. The foot had five cur curved toenails, like an elephant's, which is not necessarily true, but we'll talk about that later. But, again, at the time, it might, it, that's what they thought was true, so I don't entirely blame them. Um... <clears throat> then the baby was covered in shadow or, no. Ralph looked up and squeaked a head came into view six feet long with three long white horns one above each of the large brown eyes and a smaller horn at the tip of the nose it was a full grown triceratops 
The big animal peered at Lex and Grant, blinking slowly, and then turned its attention to Ralph. A tongue came out and licked baby Ralph, and, sque and Ralph squeaked and bumped up against the big leg ho happily. Is that his mom? Lex said. Looks like it. Should we feed the mom too? But the big triceratops was already nudging Ralph with her snout, pushing the baby away from the bars. Guess not. The infant turned away from the bars and walked off. From time to time, the big mother nudged her baby, guiding it away, as they both walked out into the field. Goodbye, Ralph, Lex said, waving. Tim came out of the shadows of the building. Tell you what, Grant said. I'm going up on the hill to set off the motion sensors, so they'll, let, so they'll know to come get us. You two stay here and wait for me. No, Lex said. Why? Just stay here. It's safe here. You're not leaving us. Right, Timmy? Right. Okay, Dr. Grant said. They crawled through the bars and stepped outside. <clears throat> Obviously, not necessarily the best idea, but you do what you can in the situation with two stubborn kids. It was just before dawn. The air was warm and humid, the sky soft pink and purple. A white mist clung to the ground, and some distance away they saw the mother triceratops and the baby moving away toward a herd of large duck-billed hadrosaurs, eating foliage from the trees at the edge of the lagoon. Some of the hadrosaurs stood knee-deep in water. They drank, lowering their flat heads and meeting their own reflections in the still water below. They looked up again, their heads swiveling. At the water's edge, one of the babies ventured out, squeaked, and scrambled back while the adults watched indulgently. Farther south, other hadrosaurs were eating the lower vegetation. Sometimes they reared up on their hind legs, resting their forelegs on the tree trunks so they could reach the leaves on the higher branches. And in the far distance, a giant apatosaur stood above the trees, the tiny head swiveling on its long neck. The scene was so peaceful, Grant found it hard to imagine any danger. So. This is a pretty decent depiction of, like, you know, a forest ecosystem of animals that hadn't lived together. While all these dinosaurs may not have necessarily lived together at the same time, they do form some kind of ecosystem with one another. And, you know, it's, it's something that kind of happens in nature sometimes if animals are forced together. I don't know too many examples of this, so I'm not going to speak on it too much. Um, but I will say I always thought that this was a really interesting tidbit. Um... That all being said, uh, obviously a lot of these animals didn't uh, live together. Um, and they never specify which hadrosaurs are here other than myosaurs a little later. Uh, but there's quite a few hadrosaurs, I think, in the book. I can't remember. The list will pop up again. Maybe tonight, maybe next week. We'll see. <clears throat> uh... Yahoo! Lex shouted, ducking. Two giant red dragonflies with six-foot wingspans hummed past them. What was that? Dragonflies, he just said. The Jurassic was a time of huge insects. So, quick pause here again. Um, there were giant insects. I don't believe there were any that got six-foot... I mean, six-foot wingspans may be from tip to tip. But, uh, I'm not positive. I think three feet was the longest. And that those were older animals. And don't get me wrong, they're still huge insects, but not quite as big as this book is making them out to be. And they also, did, those giant ones I don't believe lived in the uh, Jurassic at all. They lived before the dinosaurs, not during the time of the dinosaurs. <clears throat> Do they bite? Lex asked. No, I don't think so. Tim held out his hand. One of the dragonflies landed on it lightly. He could feel the weight of the huge insect. He's gonna bite you, Lex warned, but the dragonfly just slowly flapped its red vein transparent wings, and then, when Tim moved his arms, it flew off again. Which way do we go? Lex asked. There. They started walking across the field. They reached a black box mounted on a heavy metal tripod, the first of the motion sensors. Grant stopped and waved his hand in front of it, back and forth, but nothing happened. If the phones didn't work, perhaps the sensors didn't work either. We'll try another one, he suggested, and pointing across the field. Somewhere in the distance, they heard the roar of a large animal. <clears throat> ah, hell, Arnold said. I just can't find it. He sipped his coffee and stared bleary-eyed at the screens. He had taken all the vi video monitors offline in the control room, and he was searching for the computer code. He was exhausted. He'd been working for 12 hours. 
He turned to Wu, who had come up from the lab. Find what? The phones are still out. I can't get them back on, and I think Nedry did something to the phones. Wu lifted one phone. <clears throat> hey. It's... Oh, dear. He turned to Wu, who had come up from... Find what? The phones are still out? Okay. Come on. Come on. I'm taking this away. Sorry. Give me a second. She wants to act up. I don't know why, but uh, hopefully this way we keep her to relax a bit. Sorry, folks. <clears throat> that she can do, but... All right. Wu lifted one phone, and he heard hissing. Sounds like a modem, but it's not, Arnold said, because I went down to the basement and shut off all the modems. What you're hearing is just white noise that sounds like modem transmission. So the phone lines are jammed? Basically, yes. Nedry jammed them very well. He's inserted some kind of lockout into the program code, and now I can't find it. Because I gave that ten restore command when which erased part of the program listings. But apparently, the command to shut off the phones is still resident in the computer's memory. Wu shrugged. So, just reset the system down and you'll clear memory. I've never done it before, he said. And I'm reluctant to do it. Maybe all the systems will come back on and start up, but maybe they won't. I'm not a computer expert, and neither are you. Not really. Without an open phone line, we can't really talk to anybody who is. If the command is RAM resident, it won't throw up the code. You can do a RAM dump and search that, but you don't know what you're doing and what you're searching for. I think you can just, all you can do is reset. Zero? Come on. Come on. Get down from there. Sorry, guys. She's just going on top of my books. She should be fine, I guess. Hold on one second. I just gotta lift her down. You're making me get up, man. Get down. There you go. Sorry, just don't want her to knock my books down or... I also have Legos on that thing. It happens. <clears throat> Thank you for enjoying the mask. I'm glad you like it. How's everybody doing? No, it's not raining. I've just, uh, or it might be raining, to be honest. Kitty is adorable. She is very adorable. She's just new around here. So she's not used to everything. Not yet, at least. She'll get there. Alright, sorry. Back to it. Gennaro stormed in. We still don't have any telephones. We're working on it. We've been working on it since midnight, and Malcolm is worse. He needs medical attention. It means I'll have to shut everything down, Arnold said. I can't be sure everything will come back on at all. Gennaro said, look, there's a sick man over in that lodge. He needs a doctor or he's going to die. You can't call a doctor unless you have a phone. Four people have probably died already. Now shut down and get the phones working. Arnold hesitated. Well? Well, it's just the safety systems don't allow the computer to be shut down, and Then turn the goddamn safety systems off. Can't you get it through your head that he's going to die unless he gets help? Okay, Arnold said. He got up and went to the main panel. He opened the doors and uncovered the metal swing latches over the safety switches. He popped them off, one after another. You asked for it, Arnold said, and you got it. <clears throat> he threw the master switch. The control room went dark. All the monitors went black. Then, the three men just stood in the dark. How long do we have to wait, Janelle said. Thirty seconds. P.U., Lex said as they crossed the field. What, Grant said, alert. That smell. 
It stinks like rotten garbage. Grant hesitated. Hey, come on now. Sorry. <laughs> Grant hesitated. He stared across the field toward the distant trees, looking for movement, but he saw nothing. There was hardly a breeze to stir the branches. It was peaceful and silent in the early morning. I think it's your imagination, he said. It's not. Then he heard the honking sound. It came from the herd of duck-billed dinosaurs before them. First one animal, then another, and another, until the whole herd had taken up the honking cry. The duck-bills were agitated, twisting and turning, hurrying out of the water, circling the young ones to protect them. They smelled it too, Grant thought. With a roar, the tyrannosaur burst from the trees fifty yards away near the lagoon. It rushed out across the open field with huge strides. It ignored the people, heading straight toward the herd of hadrosaurs. I told you, Lex screamed. Nobody listens to me. In the distance, the duck-billed dinosaurs started honking and, start, and starting to run. Grant could feel the earth shake beneath his feet. Come on, kids. He grabbed Lex, lifting her bodily off the ground, and ran with Tim through the grass. He had glimpses of the tyrannosaur down by the lagoon lunging at the hadrosaurs which swung their big tails in defense and honked loudly and continuously. He heard the crashing of foliage and trees, and when he looked over, the duckbills were charging. <clears throat> bit of a bit of an intense part there. Why is my phone not charging? Sorry. Hold on a second, TikTok. My phone is not charging for some reason, which means you guys will only be online for so long if I don't figure out why. It was working just a minute ago. Hmm. That's odd. It's not charging at all for some reason. That's not good. One second here. I think I know what the problem is. Ah, sorry everybody. Um, for those asking, I got the mask a long time ago as a gift from a friend. So, I think he got it from Walmart, but I'm not positive. Either way, it's a, it was a nice gift, and I appreciate it. So, you know, I'm dang well going to use it. <clears throat> Anywho, back to our story. In the darkened control room, Arnold checked his watch. 30 seconds. The memory should be cleared by now. He pushed the main power switch back on, but nothing happened. Arnold's stomach heaved. He pushed the switch off and then on again. Still nothing happened. He felt sweat on his brow. What's wrong? Gennaro asked. Oh, hell, Arnold said. Then he remembered you had to turn the safety switches back on before you restarted the power. He flipped on the three safeties and covered them again with the latch covers. Then he held his breath and turned the main power switch. The room lights came on, the computer beeped, the screens hummed. Thank God, Arnold said. He hurried to the main motor, or the main monitor. There were rows of labels on the screen. And it shows a Jurassic Park like system startup thing. Um, here, hold on. You guys can see it first. And then you guys can see it as well. It's just kind of going, it's basically like the main screen of the computer startup. Taldaz, thank you so much for the subscription. Much appreciated. Ah, uh, that's very weird. I don't know why that would have happened that way. But, uh, I mean, I guess I appreciate you 
still making sure to do it. It's definitely weird. I don't understand why it would do it for other folks, but not yourself. Well, either way, I'm glad you got it figured out. Uh... Well, Teldas, thank you for hopping in, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Guys, give me some W's in the chat for Taldaz, by the way. Oh, dear. Sorry. Kitty cat violence. Oh, dear. Sorry, folks. This camera is leaning a bit because of all that. Almost dropped the book there, too. That should be good. <clears throat> all righty. Sorry about all that, folks. I thought I heard her getting into something else. I got worried for a second. She's just behind me on the couch. Oh, ah, man. I moved it slightly to fix the problem and it made the whole system stop. All right, but there we go. TikTok should be good. Twitch and YouTube should be good. Let's keep her going. I showed you guys the chart. Janeiro reached for the phone, but it was dead. No static hissing this time, just nothing at all. What's this? Give me a second, Arnold said. After a reset, the system modules need to have need to be brought online manually. Quickly, he went back to work. Why manually? Gennaro asked. Will you just let me work, for Christ's sake? Wu said, the system is not intended to ever shut down. So if it does shut down, it assumes that there's a problem somewhere. It requires you to start up everything manually. Otherwise, if there was a short somewhere, the system would start up, then short out, start up again, short out, and in an endless cycle. Okay, Arnold said, we're going. Gennaro picked up the phone and started to dial when he suddenly stopped. Jesus, look at that, he said. He pointed to one of the video monitors. But Arnold wasn't listening. He was staring at the map, where a tight cluster of dots by the lagoon had started to move in a coordinated way moving fast in a kind of swirl. What's happening, Gennaro said. The duckbills. They've stampeded. <clears throat> the duckbills were charging with surprising speed. Their enormous body is a tight cluster, honking and roaring, the infants squealing and trying to stay out from underfoot. The herd raised a great cloud of yellow dust. Grant couldn't see the tyrannosaur. The duckbills were running right towards them. Still carrying Lex, he ran with Tim toward a rocky outcrop with a stand of big conifers. They ran hard, feeling the ground shake beneath their feet. The sound of the approaching herd was deafening, like the sound of an airport. It filled the air and hurt their ears. Lex was shouting something, but he couldn't hear what she was saying as they scrambled through the rocks and the herd closed in around them. Grant saw the immense legs of the first hadrosaur that charged past, each animal weighing five tons and they were enveloped in clouds so dense he could see nothing at all. He had had impressions of huge bodies, giant limbs, bellowing cries of pain as the animals wheeled and circled. One duckbill struck a boulder and it rolled past them out into the field beyond. In the dense cloud of dust they could see almost nothing beyond the rocks. They clung to the boulders, listening to the screams and the honks and the menacing roar of the tyrannosaur. Lex dug her fingers into Grant's shoulder. Another hadrosaur slammed its big tail against the rocks, leaving a splash of hot blood behind. Grant waited until the sounds of the fighting had moved off to the left, and then he pushed the kids to start climbing up the largest of the trees. They climbed swiftly, feeling for the branches, as the animals stampeded all around them in the dust. They walked up twenty feet, and then Lex clutched at Grant and refused to go any further. They were t Tim was tired, too, and Grant thought that they were high enough. 
toward the dust, or through the dust, he could see the broad backs of the animals below as they wheeled and honked. Grant propped himself against the coarse bark of the trunk, coughed in the dust, closed his eyes, and waited. Arnold adjusted the camera at the he as the herd moved away. The dust slowly cleared. He saw the hadrosaurs had scattered and the tyrannosaur had stopped running, which could only mean it had made a kill. The tyrannosaur was now near the lagoon. Arnold looked at the video monitor and said, Better get Muldoon to go out there and see how bad it is. I'll go get him, Gennaro said, and left the room. <clears throat> nope, I heard a little notification there too. Michael Eastman, thanks for subscribing on YouTube. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. This next chapter is called The Park. A faint crackling sound, like a fire in a fireplace. Something warm and wet tickled Grant's ankle. He opened his eyes and saw an enormous beige head. The head tapered to a flat mouth shaped like the bill of a duck. The eyes protruding above the flat duck bill were gentle and soft like a cow's. The duck mouth opened and chewed branches on the limb where Grant was sitting. He saw the large flat teeth in the cheek and the warm lips touched his ankle again as the animal chewed. So a pause there. I don't see any mention, uh, like while they say it's shaped like a duck, they don't mention it having a beak like uh, like hadrosaurs very likely did. And so that's, uh, that's something that I don't know if he purpose if Crichton purposely omitted back then, um, but yeah, they they definitely had beaks, I believe. A duck-billed hadrosaur. He was astonished to see it up close. Not that he was afraid. All species of duck bills were herbivore. Sorry, all species of duck bills were herbivores, and one exact acted exactly like a cow. Even though it was large, the manor was so calm and peaceful that Grant didn't feel threatened. He stayed where he was on the branch, careful not to move, and watched it ate, as it ate. The reason Grant was astonished was that he had a pr proprietary feeling about the sandwich. Sorry, one second. Oh, she wants me to... Okay, okay. Here. Sorry, guys. Give me one second. Go get it. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Alright. The reason Grant was astonished was that he had a proprietary feeling about this animal. It was probably a myosaur from the Lake Cretaceous, Montana. With, Jack Ho or with John Horner, Grant had been the first to describe the species. Myosaurus had an upcurved lip, which gave them the appearance of smiling. The name meant Good Mother Lizard. Myosaurus was thought to be the Myosaur were thought to protect their eggs until the babies were born and could take care of themselves. Grant heard an insistent... Oh, come on. Did you bring it back? No, you didn't. I'm sorry. I need, I need you to back up. She has uh, an insistence to nibble on cords sometimes. I've been trying to get her to stop that. Come on. I just don't want her near all the cords. Not under the desk. Be near the desk, just not under the desk. Sorry, folks. <clears throat> uh, Grant heard an insistent chirping, and the big head swung downwards. You moved enough to see the baby hadrosaur scampering around the feet of the adult. The baby was dark beige with black spots. The adult bent her head low to the ground and waited, unmoving, while the baby stood up on its hind legs, resting its front legs on the mother's jaw, and ate the branches that protruded from the sides of its mother's mouth. The mother waited patiently until the baby had finished eating and dropped back down on all fours again. Then the big head came up towards Grant. The hadrosaur continue, continued to eat just a few feet from him. Grant looked at the two elongated air holes at the top flat upper bill. Apparently, the dinosaur couldn't smell Grant, and even though the left eye was looking right at him, for some reason, the hadrosaur didn't react to him. He remembered how the tyrannosaur had failed to see him the previous night. Grant decided on an experiment. He coughed. Instantly, the hadrosaur froze. 
The big head suddenly still, the jaws no longer chewing. Only the eyes moved, looking for the source of the sound. Then, after a moment, when there seemed to be no danger, the animal resumed chewing. Amazing, Grant thought. Sitting in his arms, Lex opened her eyes and said, Hey, what's that? The hadrosaur trumpeted an alarm, a loud, resonant honk that it so startled Lex that she nearly fell out of the tree. The hadrosaur pulled its head away from the branch and trumpeted again. Don't make her mad, Tim said from the branch above. The baby chirped and scurried back beneath the mother's legs, and the hadrosaur stepped away from the tree. The mother cocked her head and peered inquisitively at the branch where Grant and Lex were sitting. With its upturned, smiling lips, the dinosaur had an almost comical appearance. Is it dumb? Lex asked. No, Grant said. You just surprised her. Well, is she going to let us get down or what? The hadrosaur backed ten feet away from the tree, and she honked again. Grant had the impression she was trying to frighten them away, but the dinosaur didn't really seem to know what to do. She acted confused and uneasy. They walked in silence, and after a minute, the hadrosaur approached the branch again, jaws moving in anticipation. She was clearly going to resume eating. Forget it, Lex. Er, she, Forget it, Lex said. I'm not staying here. She started to climb down the branches, and at her movement, the hadrosaur trumpeted in fresh alarm. Grant was amazed, he thought. He really could, it really can't see us when we don't move. After a minute, it literally forgets that we're here. This was just like the Tyrannosaur, another classic example of an, amphi of an amphibian visual cortex. Studies of frogs had shown that the amphibians only saw moving. Sorry, TikTok. Oh, did it, it hit you guys' camera too, didn't it? Shoot. I'm sorry to Twitch and YouTube as well. My complete bad. Um, let me just make sure. Oh man, y'all are going off in the in the YouTube chat a bit, huh? All right, back to it. <clears throat> oh, um, if something didn't move, it literally didn't see it. The same thing seemed to be true of dinosaurs. So, pause here. One, I don't know why Grant would assume that all dinosaurs automatically went into the assumption of they can't see them if they don't move, when he himself says earlier in the book that it's only the animals with frog DNA that act this way. So, that's... Uh, that's one little thing that I've always been a little weirded out by in the book. Um, another thing here is that uh, that's not true. Like, amphibians see things moving easier, but it's not necessarily that they can't see things that don't move. That'd be preposterous. In any case, the Myasaur now seemed to find these strange creatures climbing down the tree too upsetting. With the final honk, she nudged... She nudged her baby and lumbered away slowly. She paused once and looked back at them and then continued on. They reached the ground and Lex shook herself off. Both children were covered in a layer of fine dust. All around them the grass had been flattened. There were streaks of blood and a sour smell. Grant looked at his watch. You better get going, kids, he said. Not me, Lex said. I'm not walking out there anymore. We have to. Why? Because, Grant said. We've got to tell them about the boat. Since they can't seem to see us on the motion sensors, we have to go all the way back ourselves. It's the only way. Why can't we take the raft? Er, why can't we take the raft? Tim suggested. What raft? Tim pointed to the low concrete maintenance building with the bars where they had spent the night. It was 20 yards away across the field. I saw a raft back there, he said. Grant immediately understood the advantages. It was now 7 o'clock in the morning, and they had at least 8 miles to go. If they could take a raft along the river, that would make the much faster progress than going over land. Let's do it, Grant said. Arnold punched the visual search mode and watched them as the monitors began to scan throughout the park, the images changing every two seconds. It was trying to watch, but it was it was fastest way to find Nedry's jeep, and Muldoon had to be adamant about that. 
He had gone out with Gennaro and looked at the stampede, but now that it was daylight, he wanted the car found. He wanted the weapons. <clears throat> His, inter his intercom clicked. Mr. Arnold, may I have a word with you, please? Mr. Arnold, may I have a word with you, please? It was Hammond. He sounded like the voice of God. You want to come here, Mr. Hammond? No, Mr. Arnold. Come to me. I'm in the genetics lab with Dr. Wu. We'll be waiting for you. Arnold sighed and stepped away from the screens. Grant stumbled deep into the gloomy recesses of the building. Brandon Dean, thanks for subscribing on YouTube. He pushed past five-gallon containers of herbicide, tree pruning equipment, spare tires for a Jeep, coils of cyclone fencing, hundreds pound feet fertilizer bag or hundred pound fertilizer bags, stack of brown ceramic insulators, empty motor oil cans, work lights and cables. But I don't see any raft. Keep going, Tim urged. Bags of cement, lengths of copper pipe, green mesh, and two plastic oars hung on clips on the concrete wall. Okay, he said, but where's the raft? It must be here somewhere, Tim said. You never saw a raft? No, I just assumed it was here. Shaking his head and poking among the junk, Grant found no raft. He did find a set of plans rolled up in a speckled with mold, with mold from humidity stuck back in a metal cabinet on the wall. He spread the plans on the floor, brushing away a big spider, and he looked at them for a long time. I'm hungry, Lex said. Just a minute. <clears throat> there were detailed topographical charts for the main area of the islands where they now were. According to this, the lagoon narrowed into the river they had seen earlier, which twisted northward, right through the aviary, and on to within a half mile of the visitor lodge. <clears throat> he flipped back through the pages. How, how to get to the lagoon? According to the plans, there should be a door at the back of the building they were in. Grant looked up and saw it, recessed into the concrete wall. The door was wide enough for a car. Opening it, he saw a paved road running straight down toward the lagoon. The road was dug below ground level, so it couldn't even be seen from above. It must be another service tunnel, and it led to a dock at the edge of the lagoon. <clears throat> and clearly stenciled on the dock was raft storage. Hey, Tim said, look at this. He held out a metal case to Grant. Opening it, Grant found a compressed air pistol and a cloth belt that held darts. There were six darts in all, each as thick as his finger. Labeled Moro 709. Good work, Tim. He slung the belt around his shoulder and stuck the gun in his trousers. Is it a tranquilizer gun? I'd say so. What about the boat? Lex said. I think it's on the dock, Grant said. They started down the road... Grant carried the, the oars on his shoulders. I hope it's a big raft, Lex said, because I can't swim. Sorry, hold on a second. This is a very long part here, and I want to do this as best I can, so we're going to pause right here. Give me just a moment here, folks. Tick tock, I'm putting you on pause like this. And then, you already know the drill, YouTube. And YouTube Twitch. Give me just a moment and I'll be right back. To everybody who's joined and everybody who's here, thank you very much for joining in. How's everybody doing tonight? Okay, yeah, thank you, Smash Sasa.
I'm doing all right, folks. I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. Well, I'm not sure who Reginald is, but happy birthday. Thank you for subscribing, much appreciated. All right, folks. Good evening, everybody hopping in. Thank you all for joining. Yes, I agree, Jesus, but why do you have to call me Daddy Dinofax? Jesus Christ. If it's advertised as not that, though, I mean, that's a different story, but, like, if it's advertised as a movie that's, like, scientifically accurate, I feel like they do have some obligation to actually be held to scientific standards. So I think Taldaz has a point. It depends on the type of movie. Never played it, it's your boy. Alrighty, folks, give me just a moment here and I'll be back. Yeah, Lego Skywalker Saga is not a set, though. It's a game. Um, like, I don't have too many Legos these days. 
I've played a lot of the old Lego games. Most of what I've got are Lego Mega Blocks, so they're not exactly Legos. Those are Mega Blocks. On the shelf right now, I've got uh, a couple different Warthogs and a Banshee. Though I need to fix up the Banshee. I dropped it like a month ago, and it needs to be fixed. Oh, and I've also got a Xenomorph Queen. That one I'll show you guys, because that one's pretty cool. If it's put together. I don't know if it is put together right now, or if that one also needs to be fixed, but... I'll show you that. Just because I love, uh, I love that. Those movies. The Alien franchise is fantastic, and if you think otherwise, oof. Sorry, I needed this water. Ah. Would you look at that? She is put together. Alright, once I turn stream on, I'll, sh I'll show you guys the, the alien queen. Oh, look at that. I picked her up and one piece fell off her immediately. Set that there, and then I'm gonna put the headset back on. Predator is a great film, I don't blame you. Tell Dawes that that's a great film, and honestly, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Give me just a second here, I'm bringing TikTok back up, and there you go, TikTok. You guys are back. Mr. Hammond, we're back in business. Um, and then let's go over to uh, Guardian. Thank you so very much. I have seen Dinosaur Planet. I absolutely love Dinosaur Planet. It is a fantastic uh, little uh, TV series. I used to watch it when I was a kid. All right. Um, and just because someone asked, this is the like alien xenomorph queen figurine. You know, she got a big ass head, and uh, yeah, she's uh, she's a pretty big like monster thing. I just have it on my shelf. Ugh. Put that back up here. Just let that sit, and then we'll get back to this. That was the queen. Philippe, thank you very much for subscribing, and Brandon, I don't know if I said thank you earlier, but thank you for subscribing as well. The Buck is probably my favorite T-Rex in the Jurassic Park series. I saw someone ask that. All right. It's a big raft, like said, because I can't swim. Don't worry, Grant said. Maybe we can catch some fish. They walked down to the road with the sloping embankment ri rising up on, s on both sides of them. They heard a deep, rhythmic snorting sound, but Grant could not see where it was coming from. Are you sure there's a, laugh a raft down there, like said, wrinkling her nose? Probably, Grant said. In a r the rhythmic snorting became louder as they walked. They all, 
but they also heard a steady droning buzzing sound. When they reached the end of the route, when they reached the end of the road at the edge of the small concrete dock, Grant froze in shock. Jesus Christ, I cannot speak tonight. I'm so sorry, folks. <clears throat> Grant froze in shock. The Tyrannosaur was right there. It was sitting upright in the shade of the tree, its hind legs stretched out in front. Its eyes were open, but it was not moving, except for its head, which lifted and fell gently with each snorting sound. The buzzing came from the cloud of flies that surrounded it, crawling over its face in slack jaws, its bloody fangs, and the red haunch of a killed hadrosaur that lay on its side behind the tyrannosaur. The rex was only twenty yards away. Grant felt sure it must have seen them, but the big animal did not respond. It just sat there. It took him a moment to realize the Tyrannosaur was asleep. Sitting up, but asleep. He signaled to Tim and Lex to stay where they were. Grant walked slowly forward onto the dock in full view of the Tyrannosaur. The big animal continued to sneak, sleep, snoring softly. Near the edge of the dock, a wooden shed was painted green to blend with the foliage. Grant quietly unlatched the door and looked inside. He saw a half dozen orange life vests hanging on the wall, several rolls of wire mesh fencing, some coils of rope, and two big rubber cubes sitting on the floor. The cubes were strapped tight with flat rubber belts. Rafts. Oh, sorry, TikTok. Didn't realize y'all couldn't see me. My bad. He looked back at Lex. She mouthed, no boat. He nodded, yes. The Tyrannosaur raised its forelimb to swipe at the flies buzzing around its snout, but otherwise it did not move. Grant pulled one of the cubes out onto the dock. It was surprisingly heavy. He freed the straps, found the inflation cylinder, and with a loud hiss the rubber began to expand, and then with a, another hiss it popped fully open onto the dock. The sound was fearfully loud, or fearfully loud in their ears. Grant turned and stared up at the dinosaur. The tyrannosaur grunted and snorted, and it begun to move. Grant braced himself to run, but the animal shifted its ponderous bulk, and then it settled back against the tree trunk and gave a long, growling belch. Lex looked disgusted, waved her hand in front of her face. Grant was soaked in sweat from the tension, and he dragged the rubber raft across the dock. It flopped into the water with a loud splash. The dinosaur continued to sleep. Grant tied the boat up to the dock and returned to the edge, and returned to the shed to take out two life preservers. He put these in the boats and waved to the kids to come out onto the dock. Pale with fear, Lex waved back, no. He gestured, yes, and the tyrannosaur continued to sleep. Grant stabbed in the air with an emphatic finger. Lex came silently, and he gestured for her to get into the raft, and then Tim got in, and they both put on their life vests. Grant got in and pushed off. The raft drifted silently out into the lagoon. Grant picked up his paddles and fitted them, on t fitted them into oar locks. They moved farther from the dock. Lex sat back and sighed loudly with relief. Then she looked stricken and put a hand over her mouth. Her body shook with muffled sounds. She was suppressing a cough. She always coughed at the wrong times. Lex, Tim whispered fiercely, looking back towards the shore. She shook her head miserably and pointing at her throat. He knew what that meant. She had a tickle in her throat. What she needed was a drink of water. Grant was rowing and Tim leaned over the side of the raft and scooped in a handful from the lagoon and held his cupped hands towards her. Lex coughed loudly and explosively. In Tim's ears, the sound echoed across the water like a gunshot. The Tyrannosaur yawned lazily and scratched behind its ear with one foot, just like a dog. It yawned again. It was groggy after its big meal, and it woke up slowly. On the boat, Lex was making little gargling sounds. Lex, shut up, Tim said. I can't help it, she would. She whispered, and then she coughed again. Grant rowed hard, mowing the raft powerfully into the center of the lagoon. On the shore, the tyrannosaur stumbled to its feet. 
I can't help, I couldn't help it, Timmy, Lex shrieked miserably. I couldn't help it. Shh! Grant was rowing as fast as he could. Anyway, it doesn't matter, she said. We're far enough away. He can't swim. Of course he can swim, you little idiot, Tim shouted at her. On the shore, the Tyrannosaur stepped off the dock and plunged into the water. It moved strongly into the lagoon after them. Well, how should I know that, she said. Everyone knows Tyrannosaurs can swim. It's in literally all the books, and anyways, all reptiles can swim. Snakes can't. Of course snakes can, you idiot. Oh, sorry, this is Tim, not Grant. Of course snakes can, you idiot. Settle down, Grant said, and hold on to something. Grant was watching the Tyrannosaur, noticing how the animal swam. The Tyrannosaur was now chest deep in the water, but it could hold its big head high above the surface. Then Grant realized the animal wasn't swimming, it was walking, because moments later, the very top of its head, the eyes and nostrils protruded above the surface, and it, then only its eyes and head. By then, it looked like a crocodile, and it swam like a crocodile, swinging its big tail back and forth as the water churned behind it. Behind the head, Grant saw the hump of the back and the ridges along the length of the tail, and it occasionally broke the surface. Exactly like a crocodile, he thought unhappily. The biggest crocodile in the world. I'm sorry, Dr. Grant, Lex wailed. I didn't mean it. Grant glanced over his shoulder. The lagoon was no more than a hundred yards wide here, and they had almost reached the center. If he continued, the water would become shallow again. The Tyrannosaur would be able to walk again, and he would move faster in the shallow water. Grant swung the boat around and began to row north. What are you doing? The Tyrannosaur was now just a few yards away. Grant could hear its sharp, snorting breath as it came closer. Grant looked at the paddles in his hands, but they were light plastic, not weapons at all. The Tyrannosaur threw its head back and opened its jaws wide, showing rows of curved teeth, and then in a great muscular spasm lunged forward toward the raft, just missing the rubber gunwale. The huge skull slapped slapping down and the raft rocking sideways away onto the crest of the splash. The Tyrannosaur sank below the surface, leaving gargling bubbles. The lagoon went still. Lex gripped the gunwale handles and looked back. Mm -hmm. Did he drown? No, Grant said, and he saw bubbles. Then a faint ripple along, along the surface, coming toward the boat. Mm -hmm. Hang on, he shouted as the head bucked up beneath the rubber, bending the boat and lifting it into the air, spinning them crazily before it splashed down again. Do something! Do something! Alexis screamed. Do something! Grant pulled the air pistol out of his belt. It looked pitifully small in his hands, but there was no... But there was a chance that if he hit the animal in the right spot, like in the eye or the nose... Sorry, my hair is getting in my eye. The Tyrannosaur surfaced beside the boat, opened its jaws, and roared. Grant aimed and fired. The dart flashed in the light, and it smacked into the Tyrannosaur's cheek. The Tyrannosaur shook its head and roared again. Ah, uh, hold on, TikTok, sorry. There we go. Uh, and then suddenly, he heard an answering roar floating across the water towards them. Looking back, Grant saw the juvenile T-Rex on the shore, crouched over the killed hadrosaur, claiming the kill as its own. The juvenile slashed at the carcass, then raised its head high and bellowed. The big Tyrannosaur saw it too, and the response was immediate. It turned back to protect its kill, swimming strongly towards the shore. He's going away, Lex squealed, clapping her hands. He's going away! Na 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 na! Stupid dinosaurs! From above, the ju juven er, from the shore, the juvenile roared defiantly. Enraged, the big tyrannosaur burst from the lagoon at full speed, water streaming from its enormous body as it raced up the hill past the dock. The juvenile ducked its head and fled, its jaws still filled with ragged flesh. The big tyrannosaur chased it, racing past the dead hadrosaur and disappearing over the hill. They heard its final threatening bellow, and then the raft moved north, around a bend in the lagoon towards the river. Exhausted from rowing, Grant collapsed back, his chest heaving. He couldn't even catch his breath. He lay gasping in the raft. 
Are you okay, Dr. Grant? Lex asked. From now on, will you just do what I tell you? Okay, she said, sighing, as if he had just made the most unreasonable demand in the world. She trailed her arm in the water for a while. You stopped rolling, she said. I'm tired, Grant replied. Then how come we're still moving? Grant immediately sat up. She was right. The raft drifted, drifted steadily north. There must be a current. The current was carrying them north toward the hotel. He looked at his watch and was astonished to see that it was 15 minutes past 7. Only 15 minutes had passed since he had last looked at the watch. It seemed like almost two hours. Grant lay back against the rubber gunwales and closed his eyes and slept as the river carried them. And that brings us to the fifth iteration of the novel, folks. A hundred percent, Taldas. That was one of my favorite scenes. Hi, Tyrannozilla. That's one of the best scenes in the entire novel, if you ask me. All right, folks. So that brings us to the, uh, the fifth iteration, um, where at the bottom, again, it says... Ian Malcolm, flaws in the system will now become severe. And once again, it shows a bit of a chart. This chart's kind of, if you guys have been paying attention, it, it's filled itself out over the course of the novel through all the iterations. Um, here, let me just make sure that you guys can see it. I couldn't tell earlier, but there you go. It's supposed to be like a mathematical curve sort of situation. Hello, Huss. Welcome back. Thank you to everybody hopping in and joining. Family Capybara, thanks for subscribing. Or er, Kaya Bayab, sorry, not Capybara. My dyslexic ass. All right, folks, moving on to the next chapter. Gennaro sat in the jeep and listened to the buzzing of the flies and started, stared at the distant palm trees wavering in the heat. He was astonished by what looked like a battleground. The grass was trampled flat for hundreds of yards in every direction. Uh, this chapter is titled Search. My bad, folks. One big palm tree was uprooted from the ground. There were great washes of blood in the grass and the, on the rocky outcropping to their right. Sitting beside him, Muldoon said, No doubt about it. Rexy's been among the hadrosaurs. He took a drink of whiskey and capped the bottle. Damn lot of flies, he said. They waited and waited. Gennaro Dant drummed his fingers on the dashboard. Uh, what are we waiting for? Muldoon didn't answer immediately. The Rex is out there somewhere, he said, squinting at the landscape in the morning sun. And we don't have any weapons worth a damn. We're in a jeep. Oh, he can outrun the jeep, Mr. Gennaro, Muldoon said, shaking his head. Once we leave this road and go out into open terrain, the best we can do in four-wheel drive is about 40 miles an hour. He'll run us right down. No problem for him, Muldoon sighed. But I don't see much moving out there now. You ready to live dangerously? Uh, sure, Gennaro said. Muldoon started the engine, at, and at the sudden sound, two small Othanelians leapt up from the matted grass directly ahead. Muldoon put the car in gear. He drove in a wild, wide circle around the trampled site and then moved inward, driving in decreasing concentric circles until he finally came to the place in the field where the little Othanelians had been. Then he got out and walked forward in the grass, away from the jeep. He stopped at a, as a dense cloud of flies lifted into the air. Uh, what is it? Gennaro called. Bring the radio, Muldoon said. Gennaro climbed out of the jeep and hurried forward. Even from the distance, he could smell the sweet, sour odor of early decay. He saw a dark shape in the grass, uh, crusted with blood, legs askew. Young Hadrosaur, Muldoon said, staring down at the carcass. The whole herd stampeded, and the young one got separated, and the Tyrannosaur brought it down. How do you know, Gennaro said. The flesh was just ragged from many bites. You can tell from the uh, from everywhere around here, from the excreta, Muldoon said. 
See those chalky white bits in the grass? That's hadrospore. Uric acid makes it white. But you look there, he pointed at a large mound rising knee high in the grass. That's tyrannospore. How do you know the tyrannosaur didn't come later? The bite pattern, Mulden said. See those little ones, he pointed along the belly? Those are from the othi. Those bites haven't bled. They're post-mortem from scavengers. Othies did that. But the hadrosaur was brought down by a bite on the neck. You see the big slash there above the shoulder blades. And that's the T-Rex, no question. Gennaro bent over the carcass, staring awkward, staring at the awkward, trampled limbs with a sense of unreality. Beside him, Muldoon flicked on his radio. Control? Yeah, John Arnold said over the radio. We got another hadro dead. Juvenile. Muldoon bent down among the flies and checked the skin on the sole of the right foot. A number was tattooed there. Specimen number is HD09. The radio crackled. I've got something for you. Oh, what's that? I found Nedry. <clears throat> the jeep burst through the line of the palm trees along the east road and came out into a narrower service road leading toward the jungle river. It was hot in this area of the park and the jungle close and fetid around them. Muldoon was fiddling with the computer monitor in the jeep, which now showed a map of the resort with overlaid grid lines. They found him up on the remote video. Sector 1104 is just ahead. Farther up the road, Gennaro saw a concrete barrier and the jeep parked alongside it. He must have taken a wrong turn off. The little bastard, Muldoon said. What'd he take? Gennaro asked. Wu says 15 embryos. Know what that's worth? Gennaro shook his head. Somewhere between 2 and 10 million, Muldoon replied. He shook his head. Big, big stakes. As they came closer, Gennaro saw the body lying beside the car. The body was indistinct and green, but then the green shape scattered away as the jeep pulled to a stop. Compies, Muldoon said. The compies found him. A dozen procumsognophytes, delicate little predators no larger than ducks, stood at the edge of the jungle, chittering excitedly as the men climbed out of the car. Dennis Nedry lay on his back, the chubby boyish face now red and bloated. Flies buzzed around the gasping mouth and thick tongue. His body was mangled, the intestines torn open, one leg chewed through. Gennaro looked away quickly to look at the little compies, which squit, squatted on their hind legs a short distance away and watched the men cautiously. The little dinosaur had five-fingered hands, he noticed. They wiped their faces and chins, giving them an eerily human quality. I'll be damned, Muldoon said. It wasn't the compies. What? Muldoon was shaking his head. See those blotches on his shirt and his face? Smell that uh, sweet old uh, smell like dried vomit? Gennaro rolled his eyes. He smelled it. That's dilo saliva. Spit from the Dilophosaurus. You see the damage on the corneas, all that redness? In the eyes it's painful, but not fatal. You got about two hours to wash it out with antivenin. We keep it all around the park just in case. Not that it mattered to this bastard. They blinded them and just ripped them down the middle. Not a nice way to go. Maybe there's justice in the world after all. The Procum Sagmethid squeaked and hopped up and down as Gennaro opened the back door and took out gray metal tubing and a stainless steel case. It's all still there, he said, and smiling. He handed two dark cylinders to Gennaro. What are those? Gennaro said. Just what they look like, Muldoon said again with a smile. Rockets. As Gennaro backed away, he said, watch it. You don't want to step in something. Gennaro stepped carefully over Nedry's body. Muldoon carried the tubing to the other jeeps and placed it in the back. He climbed behind the wheel. Let's go, he said. What about him, Gennaro said, pointing to the body. What about him? We've got things to do. He put the car in gear. Looking back, Gennaro saw the compies resume their feeding. One jumped up and squatted on Nedry's open mouth as it started nibbling on the flesh of his nose. All right, folks. The jungle river became narrower. The banks closed in on both sides until the trees and foliage overhanging the banks met high above the block, met high above to block out the sun. Tim heard the cry of birds and saw the small chirping dinosaurs leaping among the branches. 
but mostly it was silent, the air hot and still beneath the canopy of trees. Grant looked at his watch. It was eight o'clock. They drifted along peacefully, among the dappled patches of light. If anything, they seemed to be moving faster than before. Awake now, Grant lay on his back and stared up at the branches overhead. In the bow, he saw her. In the bow, he saw her reaching up. Hey, what are you doing? He said. You think we can eat those berries? She said, pointing at the trees. Some of the overhanging branches were close enough to touch. Tim saw clusters of bright red berries on the branches. No, Grant said. Why? The little dinosaurs are eating them. She pointed to the small dinosaurs, scampering on the branches. No, Lex. She sighed, dissatisfied with his authority. I wish Daddy was here, she said. Dad always knows what's to do. What are you talking about, Tim said. He never knows what to do. Yes, he does, she sighed. She stared at the trees as they slid past, the big roots twisting toward the water's edge. Just because you're not his favorite. Tim turned away and said nothing. But don't worry, Dad still likes you too, even if you're into computers and not sports. Dad's a real sports nut, Tim explained to Grant. Grant nodded. Up in the branches, small, pale, yellow dinosaurs, barely two feet tall, hopped from tree to tree. They had beaky heads like parrots. You know what they call those, Tim said? Microceratops. Today we call them microceratus because of a naming dispute. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Big deal, Lex said. I thought you might be interested. Only very young boys, she said, are interested in dinosaurs. Not true! Not true, Lex! Says who? Dad? Tim started to yell, but Grant raised his hand. Kids? He said, shut up! Why? She said, Lex said, I can do what I want if I... Then she felt silent, because she heard it too. It was a blood-curdling shriek from somewhere downriver. God damn, Lex. Sometimes she does need to shut up. I get she is a kid, 100% a kid, and I understand it's kind of realistic for spoiled kids in this kind of situation, but god damn, Lex. Well, where the hell is the damn Rex, Muldoon said, talking into the radio, because we don't see him here. They were back at the sauropod compound, looking out at the trampled grass where the hadrosaurs had stampeded. The tyrannosaur was nowhere to be found. Checking now, Arnold said and clicked off. Muldoon turned to Gennaro. Checking now, he repeated sarcastically. Why the hell didn't he check before? Why didn't he keep track of him? I don't know, Gennaro said. He's not showing up, Arnold said, and a moment later... What do you mean he's not showing up? He's not on the monitors. Motion sensors aren't finding him. Hell, Muldoon said. So much for the motion sensors. You see Grant and the kids? Motion sensors aren't finding them either. Well, what are we supposed to do now? Wait. Look, look. Directly ahead, of the, directly ahead, the big dome of the aviary rose above them. Grant had seen it only from a distance, and now he realized it was enormous, a quarter of a mile in diameter or more. The patterns of geodesic struts str shone dully through the light mist, and at first he thought the glass must weigh a ton. Then, as they came closer, he saw there wasn't any glass, just struts, a thin mesh hung inside the elements. Oh, it isn't finished, Lex said. I think it's meant to be open like that, Grant said. Then all the birds can fly out. Not if they're big birds. The river c carried them beneath the edge of the dome. They start, they start, stared upwards. Now they were inside the dome, still drifting down river. But within minutes, the dome was so high above them that it was hardly visible in the mist. Grant said, I seem to remember there's a second lodge here. And moments later, he saw the roof of a building over the tops of the trees to the north. You want to stop? Tim? You want to stop? Tim said. Maybe there's a phone or motion sensors. Grant steered towards the shore. We need to try to contact the control room. It's getting a little late in the morning. They clambered out, slipping onto the muddy blank. bank. And Grant hauled the raft out the water. Then he tied the rope to a tree and they set off through a dense forest of palm trees. And that brings us to our next chapter, Aviary, which unfortunately we'll read next week. I'm sorry to have a shorter stream today, folks, but my tooth is, I should say, so I had uh, a tooth extracted on Monday because it was having some problems and whatnot. And uh, because of that, my mouth is a little tender, a little sore. It's a little hard to keep reading even after drinking water. 
Um, so I apologize, but I will probably have to cut us off early tonight. Uh, so I'm very, very sorry about all that. Um, to TikTok, thank you all so very much for tuning in tonight. I'm going to have to uh, take you offline first, but just know I appreciate you very much, and I hope I see you guys again next Friday. Much love. And now, all right, sorry, just had to make sure that turned off. close that alrighty and then to everybody on Twitch and YouTube thank you all so much for tuning in once again I know once again I'm sorry that this was a shorter stream um, but I promise I will see you guys next time yeah that's what I did during my break earlier tell Daz, I was literally taking some ibuprofen I appreciate you guys all understanding. Yeah, that, it's definitely not the best. Not the best, Jesus. IDK, uh, most definitely. I will see you guys all next time. Once again, thank you all so very much for watching. Couldn't be here without you. And honestly, again, much love to each and every one of you. Make sure you guys just have a great day. Remember to be good people. And I'll catch you.